Hey Doc, what's a terpene? You guys have probably heard me say terpenes like a thousand times by now. Are you ready for the explanation? If you're an experienced cannabis user, or if you're my patient, then you've likely heard about terpenes and you know what they are to some degree. If you're new to cannabis and you don't know what terpenes are, great, this video is for you. These next couple of videos are gonna be teaching you way more about terpenes than you probably ever wanted to know. What's going on everybody? This is Dr. Andrioni from Cannabis Doctors of Florida. In today's video, I'm gonna be hitting you with what terpenes are, why terpenes are, which ones we normally see in cannabis, and much more. I think you guys are gonna learn a lot from this video. Be sure to watch till the end. So, what are terpenes? It's funny, because this sounds like a simple question to answer, but it's not. Terpenes, aka isoprenoids, are the most diverse group of naturally occurring aromatic phytochemicals produced by pretty much every plant species on Earth, including cannabis. Phyto means plant, so a phytochemical is a chemical produced by a plant. Terps are responsible for the taste and smell of plants, and some of the pigment as well. Take a look at this lemon here. In addition to other terps, I bet you there's a high amount of limonene. And what do we have here? I bet you there's a lot of farnesine in here. It's the particular combination of terpenes made by a plant that gives it its signature aroma, color, and flavor. As is true for cannabis. Think of the terps as acting like a sensory fingerprint, if you will. Terpenes also happen to form the largest group of plant chemicals, with about 15 to 20,000 characterized so far. Terps are everywhere, and while we may think terpenes were just about making things smell good, they do a lot more than that. Terpenes are produced to serve a variety of protective ecological roles for the plant producing them. For example, we know that terpene production favors agents such as limonene and pinene in flowers that are repellent to insects, while lower fan leaves express higher concentrations of bitter sesquiterpenoids that acts as an anti-feeding for grazing animals. And what's even cooler, the specific mixture of terpenes that the secretory cells produce will determine trichome viscosity. Hey Martha, what's trichome viscosity? We all know this as trichome stickiness. What's good play, you got that sticky icky? This stickiness actually provides a synergistic mechanochemical defense strategy versus predators like insects where it actually traps them and kills them. Wow, cannabis is savage, as is nature. Also, depending on the plant species, terpenes also serve to attract pollinators. This example doesn't really apply to cannabis as cannabis is wind pollinated, but it's still good to know. So, terpenoids as well as cannabinoids are synthesized within secretory cells inside glandular trichomes. Glandular trichomes are most highly concentrated in the flower of the unfertilized female cannabis plant, just prior to senescence or the end of its life cycle. And so that's why we're actually using the bud or the flower, because that's where the most trichomes are, and that's where we get the medical benefits. The literature shows that about 10 or 20 years ago, cannabis' terpenoid yield was said to be less than 1% in most cannabis assays, and they represented up to 10% of trichome content. However, due to the selective breeding over the years, and I guess the advances in technology and botany, today the terpenoid yields range anywhere from 2 to 4%, and the terps can represent up to 40% of the trichome content. These are some staggering numbers. You know, with an increase in terp percentage, you can also expect an increase in cannabinoid percentage too. I hate to say it, but I have to acknowledge it, les I. It's the use of high-potency cannabis that's been linked with the increased risks of psychosis, cannabis use disorder, cannabinoid hyperemesis, and the list goes on. This kind of goes along with what I've been telling you the whole time where high THC products are not always better. However, there is good news. You can still find plenty of chemovars with moderate amounts of THC and a pretty significant terpene profile. And the first step in doing this is to look at the COA. If you haven't seen that video, you should watch that and then come back to this. On a super interesting note, remember how I mentioned that terpenes dictate the smell and taste of plants? Well, this may no longer come as a surprise to you, although it probably would have 10 minutes ago, but it's really the terpenoids and not the cannabinoids that are responsible for the aroma of cannabis. In fact, pure THC doesn't even have a scent. And fun fact, terpenes are the largest compound by weight that contribute to the aroma that can be found in cannabis, which is pretty freaking awesome. So I guess hypothetically, we may be able to assume that the larger the terpene percentage, the stronger the aroma of the cannabis would be. Before we keep going, even though I'm saying that terpenes are mainly responsible for the aroma of cannabis, there are other plant chemicals like the terpenoids, maybe the flavonoids, the esters, the aldehydes, and the thiols that are also contributing to the aromatics. Hey doc, wait a sec. What's the difference between a terpene and a terpenoid? A terpene and a terpenoid? Great question. So terpenes are simple hydrocarbons, which I'll get into in a moment, whereas terpenoids are a modified class of terpenes with different functional groups containing oxygen in various positions. Not all terpenes are terpenoids, but all terpenoids are terpenes, if you catch my drift. A tomato, tomato. I often use these terms interchangeably, but technically they're different. And it's these differences that are responsible for the different aromas. Pretty cool, huh? And it's also the structural and functional differences that are what make terpenoids biologically active. Even cooler, huh? And more on that. 
The building blocks of both terpenes and terpenoids are these teeny tiny hydrocarbons called isoprene units. An isoprene unit contains five carbon atoms with their respective hydrogens, hence the hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons are naturally super volatile. No, I'm not talking about your ex's mental state. In our case, the more volatile a compound is, the more likely that we're able to detect its aroma via our olfactory system or our sense of smell. A good example of this is gasoline. The gas that we use to fuel our cars, those are mixtures of hydrocarbons. The point in all this is that gas is super smelly, gas is formed from a mixture of hydrocarbons, and hydrocarbons are super volatile. So we can kind of deduce that the more volatile something is, the more aromatic it can be, and the more likely that we're able to detect it. And so this example applies to terpenes and terpenoids as well, because these are hydrocarbons also. And that's why we're able to detect their aroma so well. Speaking of gas. Is that why cannabis smells like gas? Nah, I don't think so. Is it? Great question though, because a terpene is actually responsible for that gas smell, as we'll see later. Do you know which one it is? If so, let me know in the comments. All right, so back to the isoprene units. These isoprene units will come together in a variety of ways to form terpenes. So it's only fitting that terpenes are classified based on how many isoprene units they contain. For example, we see that monoterpenes have two isoprene units. We see that sesquiterpenes have three isoprene units. And then we see that diterpenes have four isoprene units and so on. It's the monoterps and the sesquiterps that we care about because these are the ones that we mostly see in cannabis. So out of the thousands of terpenes that are reported to be found in nature, about 150 to 200 are reportedly found to be in cannabis. According to a recent publication, 50 cannabis terpenes are routinely encountered in North American chemovars. And of those, 17 are most common, which I'll list here. And of these 17, several predominate to form eight terpene superclasses. We got myrcene, we got terpinaline, we got limonene, we got beta caryophylline we got alpha-pinene, we got humulene, or alpha caryophylline linolol, Osamine. Another recent publication identified five terpenes to be most common. The first four from the previous study, and then the fifth most common they found to be was bisobolol. It's a weird name, but... And based on what I've seen in the dispensary so far and all the certificate of analysis that I've seen and documented, I would have to agree with all of those, and then I would even add one more. I do see farnesine more often than not. So now that we understand terpenes and we know which ones are most commonly found in cannabis, I'm gonna end it with this. Why are terpenes special? I want you to think of it like this. THC is like the gas pedal, CBD is like the brake pedal, and terpenes are the steering wheel. Without the steering wheel, you're kind of just getting high. But I'll explain more of this in the next video. And guys, at the end of the day, you may or may not realize it, but terpenes have extensive uses in our everyday life. They're in the foods that we eat, the cosmetics and the perfumes that we use and wear, the cleaning supplies we use, and a bunch of other stuff. So even if terpenes weren't meant for us, we've clearly adapted to them. Stay tuned for the next video. We're going to be going in depth on all those terpenes that we just mentioned. You're not going to want to miss it. Please let me know if you found this video helpful or you learned something. And also, let me know if there's any other topics that you'd like me to cover down in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe. There's still a lot more to come. To my subscribers, thank you for your support. And to everybody, I'll see you next time. Hey, Vinny, I got that sticky icky.